All right, we are continuing our study in the book of Job, Faithful Living in Times of Crisis. And this is lesson number five in this uh, series. And the title of this lesson, very much like the last lesson, is uh, The Theological Crisis, but it's part two. Part two, and we're going to cover chapter 15 all the way to chapter 21. I hope if you've had time to this week to read that over, you'll be familiar with the passages because as I've mentioned, I don't read all of it. We read selected ones, but not all of them. I'll leave that to you. So we're in the part of the book where Job's three friends have come to sit with him for a while and normally would be there to commiserate, to, to encourage him, to support him. This was the traditional uh, thing that uh, friends did when someone was uh, suffering uh, difficulties or trial, illness. So the, the three friends come and um, uh, they uh, begin making comments about Job's situation. Last week we, we ran through a cycle of those uh, comments. Uh, one of them makes a speech. Job not necessarily rebuts the things that the person says, but he makes a speech and answer, and then the second one makes a speech in Job, and it's kind of followed that pattern. And that's why I say part two here, we continue with these speeches and the response to the, uh, to the speeches. So in their attempt to make sense of the catastrophic things that have happened to Job, the three men rely primarily on the common theological thought or axiom of the day, which proposed that God blessed the righteous and he punished sinners, and he did so in real time here on earth. Now at a time when there was not a lot of revelation about life after death, this meant that the blessings and punishments were administered here on earth during what was believed to be your, your only conscious life. So we need to understand that uh, for the friends, therefore, the conclusion was an easy one. This was easy, easy for them. I mean, there's a no brainer. Bad things had happened to Job. Therefore, he must have done something bad to deserve these things. You know, no deep thought there. It was plain, plain as, as could be. And, and, and their speeches and in their speeches, they're trying to convince him of this. You know, wake up, you know, smell the roses, see what's going on here. Now in their speeches, they will frame their arguments in different ways, claiming that Job has rejected this doctrine of retribution, if you wish or that Job is ignoring the wisdom of the ancients. That was Bildad's argument. Or that Job is just a whiner and he should simply repent and just get this thing over with. Why don't you just repent and get it over with, you know, and then we can go home. And that's, that's Zophar, that's his, you know, that's his, um, his argument. We also need to understand something else about what's going on here. We need to understand that there is no theological dilemma for these men. There may be one for Job, but there's no dilemma for these guys. They are sure that they know what has happened. And I repeat in their mind, Job is being punished for his sins. And they know what the solution is. Just confess the sin and repent and let's move on. So they're absolutely sure of their theology and sure of the solution to the problem that Job has. They're also convinced that their theology is sound. In their mind, you know, God who makes no mistakes always blesses the good and always punishes the sinners. So what, what's there to debate here? There is no debate as far as they're concerned. Now, as I've mentioned before, the theological crisis or the theological dilemma is Job's experience, not their experience. He, like they, firmly believes in the doctrine of retribution. He believes it, just like they believe it. However, he, unlike his friends, also knows that he is not a sinner, but rather a righteous man. You know, in his mind, he's saying, I know I'm a righteous man. I know my life. I can review my life and I can tell you that I haven't committed a sin or I haven't done something you know, that warrants this type of punishment. I know this to be true. On the other hand, I also know to be true that God punishes 
sinners and He blesses righteous people. So you know, I can't make these two things fit here, okay? So his theology that guided all of his life to this point no longer lines up with the reality that he's experiencing. Wow, it's like somebody came along and proved that there was no God. I mean, in his life, that this, was, this was the crisis. The thing that he had lived his life, you know, according to all these years, all of a sudden does not make any sense. So in his replies to his friends so far, he doesn't defend against their arguments, nor does he try to resolve the contradiction that's taking place between his beliefs and the reality that he's experiencing. He's got no answer for that, not yet anyways. It's this contradiction that is at the heart of his crisis, not just the physical and emotional suffering that he has to endure. Sure, he's got you know, sores all over his body and sure, he's lost everything, of course, but the real suffering for him is the spiritual one because it's the thing that he goes to for, for, for help and for support and for, uh, for encouragement and it doesn't work for him anymore. Now the fact that there is this contradiction between his belief about God and what has happened to him means that he has no access to spiritual comfort since he can't answer the question, does God punish the innocent? because that little question is just you know, creeping up in the back of his mind. Does God really punish the innocent? If the answer to this question is yes, then Job is at a spiritual dead end with the information he presently has about God. If that's true, God punishes the innocent, well, I don't know where to go. <laughs> if that is true, I, you know, uh, there's nowhere for me to go uh, if you're Job. If the answer is no, you know, God doesn't punish the innocent, then what's going on here? Why is God allowing this to happen? So this brings us to the second cycle of speeches made by his friends and Job. So it's been suggested that the theme of this second cycle of speeches is the fate of the wicked. So we begin with Eliphaz. Now remember Eliphaz, he was the one who was kind in his previous approach, but this time he dispenses with any niceties and he begins this speech by questioning Job's wisdom. So let's read a portion, chapter 15, verses one and two. Then Eliphaz the Temanite responded, should a wise man answer with windy knowledge and fill himself with the east wind? And so, he begins by accusing Job of presumptuousness. In other words, he challenges Job's assumption that he is right and justified, contrary to the wisdom of the ancients. Job, you know, according to Eliphaz, is undermining accepted norms of religion, and he's going against tradition by claiming his innocence in the presence of overwhelming evidence to the contrary. In other words, Eliphaz is saying, come on, man, open your eyes. Can't you see what's happening here? How can you even think that there's nothing wrong with you? Look at all the bad things that have happened. So his argument basically is, how can you claim innocence when God's punishment is upon you and demonstrates otherwise? So we continue reading. The passage continues, should he argue with useless talk or with words which are not profitable? Indeed, you do away with reverence and hinder meditation before God. For your guilt teaches your mouth and you choose the language of the crafty. Your own mouth condemns you and not I, and your own lips testify against you. Were you the first man to be born? Or were you brought forth before the hills? Do you hear the secret counsel of God and limit wisdom to yourself? What do you know that we do not know? What do you understand that we do not? Both the gray-haired and the aged are among us, older than your father. Are the consolations of God too small for you? Even the word spoken gently with you? Why does your heart carry you away and why do your eyes flash? 
that you should turn your spirit against God and allow such words to go out of your mouth. What is man that he should be pure? Or he who is born of a woman that he should be righteous? Behold, he puts no trust in his holy ones and the heavens are not pure in his sight, how much less one who is detestable and corrupt, man who drinks iniquity like water. So Eliphaz, with a lot more, uh, you know, a lot more energy this time, charges Job with adding the sin of presumptuousness. In other words, challenging God's wisdom, he adds this sin to all the other sins that uh, he claims Job is guilty of. He also reminds Job of the dangers of not having a clear conscience before God and the speedy destruction of the wicked. You know, the message being, you can't win against God, so just repent, stop fighting, just repent and do what you know is right. That's his, you know, his argument. We continue reading, a few more verses. Distress and anguish terrify him. They overpower him like a king ready for the attack because he has stretched out his hand against God and conducts himself arrogantly against the Almighty. Well, that's his finishing salvo there. You know, you, you're, you're fighting God, how presumptuous of you to think that you can get in the ring and, and, and fight it out with God and think that you're going to win. So Job uh, speaks more directly to his friends in this cycle, but not necessarily answering their arguments or accusations like in a defensive mode. Instead, he reasserts his uh, innocence. Today we'd say he just doubles down. He doubles down on his innocence. His reply and speech after Eliphaz's comments have five main points, and I've summarized these for you. First point, he reproaches the hard heartedness of all of his friends. So we read it in 16, verse one to five, this is Job speaking, then Job answered, I have heard many such things. Sorry comforters are you all. Is there no limit to windy words or what plagues, uh, or what plagues you, that uh, you answer? I too could speak like you if I were in your place. I could compose words against you and shake my head at you. I could strengthen you with my mouth and the solace of my lips could lessen uh, your pain. And so uh, he reproaches the hard heartedness of his friends. He rebukes them for the fact that they bring nothing new to the table, not even comforting words. Could you at least say something nice to me? And he goes on to say, he too could criticize if he were them, but he could also bring comfort, which they have not done yet. So that's the first thing he says. Sir. The next thing he says, he claims that he has now been abandoned by both God and man, even though he is innocent. So we read verse 14. He breaks through me with breach after breach. He runs at me like he's talking about God doing this to him now. He says, he breaks through, uh, he breaks through me with breach after breach. He runs at me like a warrior. I have sewed sackcloth over my skin and thrust my horn in the dust. My face is flushed from weeping and deep darkness is on my eyelids. Although there is no violence in my hands and my prayer uh, is pure. So now he claims that he's been abandoned by both God and man. He is a man suffering in innocence. Since they witness against him, his friends, he declares that the only true witness he can count on to declare his innocence are in heaven. You know, since I can't, you know, I, can't, I can't depend on my kids, they're gone. I can't depend on my wife, she abandoned me. I cannot depend on you guys because you've got nothing but criticism. The, I guess the only people I can depend on are in heaven. Now, uh, let me just read a, a passage, very interesting that he says this, okay? Let's just read verse 18 to 22. It says, O earth, do not cover my blood and let there be no resting place for my cry. Even now, behold, my witness is in heaven and my advocate is on high. My friends are my scoffers. My eye weeps to God. Oh, that a man might plead with God as a man with his neighbor. For when a few years are past, I shall go the way of no return. 
But it's interesting, you know, he said, the only people that you know, have my back, the only people that can, can comfort me, they're in heaven, right? Well, he's correct in this, isn't he? He may have said it just you know, as, a, as, as a, a defense, but he's actually correct in what he, in what he says. Uh, since God and the angels know the real story, the irony of it is that he has guessed correctly, but he doesn't know why. Yes, it's true actually. The only ones who can defend you, the only ones who really understand what's going on are God and the angels because they were witnesses to the, you know, what went on with the God and the devil and so on and so forth. Job has put his finger on it, but he doesn't realize he's put his finger on it. Okay? So his fourth statement, his fourth statement is Job's assessment of the present situation concerning the relationship with his friends. In short, he has simply become a byword to them and he criticizes them for this development. So let's read what he says here. He says, but he has made me a byword of the people and I am one at whom men spit. My eye has also grown dim because of grief and all my members are as a shadow. The upright will be appalled at this and the innocent will stir up himself against the godless. Nevertheless, the righteous, will, uh, the righteous will hold to his way, and he who has clean hands will grow stronger and stronger. You know, he says, you've made me a byword. A byword, this term, a, a person uh, who personifies a type. That's what the term byword is. In Job's case, uh, he's become a personification of an arrogant sinner who refuses to repent and is punished for it by God. In other words, in today's you know, slang, if you wish, he's, he's saying, I've become that guy. You know, the guy who does wrong and the guy you know, who refuses to repent and the guy that God punishes him and keeps punishing him because he refuses to repent. He says, you people have made me that guy. I'm now a byword. And he's saying that because in his heart he knows he's not that guy, okay? But they've made him that guy with their accusations uh, against him. So we read 17 verse 10, he says, but come again all of you now, for I do not find a wise man among you. Note that despite this, Job continues to challenge his friends. Job's conclusion, therefore, is that all is lost and death will become his only deliverance. So he said five things to them. He reproaches them for their hard heartedness. He tells them he's been now abandoned by everybody, even them. He then says the interesting thing, now the only people that understand my plight are God and the angels in heaven. And he's right about that, but he doesn't know he's right about that. Then he says to them, you people have made me that guy. You know, they made me a byword, a type, a negative type, if you wish. And then finally he ends and he says, death is my only deliverance in verse 15 and 16. It says, where now is my hope? And who regards my hope? Will it go down with me to Sheol? Shall we together go down into the dust? So in this we see a crack, if you wish, in, in Job's faith. Not in his faith in God's existence. Remember I said to you last week, he knows too much to deny God's existence. No matter what happens to me, you know, whether I'm crushed, beaten down, no matter what, I lose everything, I just cannot deny that God exists. I know too much for that. So he's not denying God's existence, but rather, a lessening of his faith in what God can do for him. He's starting to doubt that God can pull him out of this situation. He's starting to doubt that God will or can kind of you know, prove that he is really a good guy. He really is a righteous man. He figures that all is lost and all that is left for him is to die in order to end his suffering. Now I want you to keep this thought in mind when we finish the book, okay? Because he's at the point now thinking, I only got one thing left to do and, and, and that's to die, all right? Okay, so we move on to Bildad. Bildad, the second friend, 
seems to become more irritable as he pursues his condemnation of Job with his second speech. And so the second speech of Bildad, uh, in his second speech, he tells Job that his present situation is simply a foretaste of his ultimate fate. Wow, <laughs> with friends like these, Basically, he's saying, Job, you ain't seen nothing yet. You think this is bad? You don't know what's coming. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is what he says to, uh, to Job. So we read in verse uh, chapter 18 this time, five and six. Indeed, he says, the light of the wicked goes out and the flame of his fire gives no light. The light in his tent is darkened and his lamp goes out above him. And so Bildad's point <laughs> is that in the end, no one will remember Job. This is what God does to the wicked. You think it's bad now, at least now you're alive, at least people know your story and you know, you're able to defend yourself. You know. But when God is through with you, not only will you be dead, nobody will remember you. Okay. So we read verse 17. It says, memory of him perishes from the earth and he has no name abroad. He is driven from light into darkness and chased from the inhabited world. He has no offering or posterity among his people, nor any survivor where he sojourned. Those in the west are appalled at his fate, and those in the east are seized with horror. Surely such are the dwellings of the wicked, and this is the place of him who does not know God. So Bildad doesn't mince any words here. You're guilty, you're a sinner, you're going down and you don't know how bad it's going to be. Let me tell you how bad it's going to be. You think this is bad. Wait, wait till you see what God does to you next. Well, of course, Job in his isolation, you know, he's rejected by his wife, his friends. He cries out for sympathy. He cries out for light somehow. Many believe this is one of the highlights of the entire book, not only from the storyline, but from a, a poetic sense, from a writing uh, sense. So Job uh, begins uh, his second speech by uh, protesting his friend's lack of understanding. Before he said, you guys, you're no helpers at all. You, you bring me no comfort. Now he says, you guys, you, you can't understand. You, you, you don't understand what I'm going through. So we move to chapter 19. Verse three and four, Job says, these 10 times you have insulted me. You're not ashamed to wrong me. Even if I have truly erred, my error lodges with me. So he renews his argument that whatever they think he has done wrong, the truth is that God has punished an innocent man and he wishes they would understand this. They never acknowledge what he's trying to say. Every time he says, but I'm innocent. Believe me when I tell you I'm innocent. There's a dilemma here. There's a problem here. And they just skip right over that and they just keep you know, they keep, uh, they keep accusing him and condemning him. And so he cries out to them, can't you at least acknowledge what I'm saying to you? Can't you understand what my problem is? My problem isn't just that I've lost my family or my health. My problem is I'm innocent man and I'm being punished by God. That's why he's saying, you have no insight. Can you give me some insight to this? So as I say, Job uh, sees himself as uh, being despised uh, by both man and uh, God. Excuse me, I forgot to read, uh, uh, we, we were supposed to read five and six. He says, if indeed you vaunt yourselves against me and prove my disgrace to me, know then that God has wronged me and has closed his net around me. So there he goes, he's, he's saying, you, know, you guys are condemning me. Don't you realize what God has done to me, the innocent man? So Job sees himself as being despised by both God and man, a true low point. And his, his, his cry there is, can this get any worse? Can this get any worse? So we read in chapter 19, two verses, verse 10 and 13, it says, he breaks me down on every, now he's talking about God, he says, he breaks me down on every side and I am gone. And he has uprooted my hope like a tree. How visually powerful that is. He's uprooted, my, he's uprooted my hope, imagine that. And then he says, he has removed my brothers far from me and my acquaintances are completely estranged from me. So this is what God has done 
whatever hope I had, God has just ripped it away. And then, and my friends, well, they've been estranged uh, uh, from me. So Job now appeals uh, to the future for some kind of vindication since he has lost hope for the present time. And we go a little further into chapter 19, hopes into the future. Chapter 19, he says, oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book that with an iron stylus, a stylus and a lead, they were engraved in the rock uh, uh, forever. So he claims that if his defense and appeal is preserved, you know, he says in stone or in copper because that way it'll stay, right? For many, many, many years. So he claims that if his defense and appeal is preserved, perhaps someone in the future generations will read it and will understand and eventually will vindicate him. Because you know what, right now in the here and now, you guys, you three guys, you don't understand and you don't have a way of explaining this to me. So if I could write down my argument you know, in, in stone or, or in metal, maybe somebody in the future will have some insight uh, to be able to explain what has happened, uh, uh, what has happened to me. Uh, uh, he claims that, uh, yes, okay. So he also makes his uh, final appeal to God himself, since he is convinced that neither his friends in the present nor appeals to posterity will succeed in the end. And so in chapter 19, 25, he says, as for me, I know that my redeemer lives and at the last he will take his stand uh, on, the, on the earth. In other words, he believes that God alone is responsible for his circumstances and God alone will be able to redeem him. And here we see a definite shift in Job's faith and thinking. Right here, if you wanted to know, you know, things are going along at a certain pace here. They speak, he speaks, they speak, he speaks. They have the same arguments back and forth. But right here, there's a shift, a shift in Job's thinking. A change is taking place in his thinking. At the lowest point you know, uh, in his mind, rejected by God, rejected by men, Job continues to hope in God, not just believe that he is, but trust that he will save Job, here's the key word, somehow. Somehow God will save me. To me, that's the essence of faith. When you don't know, but you continue to trust that somehow God will redeem you. Somehow God will take you out of the fiery furnace that you're experiencing. When you, when you can't even imagine the scenario of how that will happen, but you continue to trust and hope that God is able and will one day do it, even if you can't imagine how he will do it. And for Job, this is now a shift in thinking. He's gone beyond arguing with God, whether you know, he's innocent or guilty. He has now just thrown his, himself on the mercy of God. And I don't know about you, but there are times in life when we, that's what we need to do. There are some times in life, you know, we need to stop trying to figure everything out. We need to stop you know, trying to write the scenario for God to you know, fill it out for us. There are just some times we have to throw ourselves on his mercy. I can't figure it out. I don't know what's going to happen. But I know that if I continue to have faith in you, God, and what's the faith? Not just the faith that he exists, but the faith that he actually loves us. Uh, the faith that the sacrifice of Jesus is actually sufficient uh, to take care of our sins, all of them. That God's mercy is great enough uh, to overlook our worst offenses. That uh, God is willing to do this. So many of us have the idea that getting to heaven, we're almost at heaven and it's like hanging on a cliff and, and, and we're, you know, we're trying to get up there you know, and God is up there you know, banging on our fingers. Ah, oh, no, you're not going to make it. You know, there's such a corrupt 
the image of God. God wants you to go to heaven more than you want to go to heaven. He desires your salvation even more than you desire it. He works for it a lot more than we work for it. And this is the shift here that has taken place in Job. He stopped arguing for a moment and realizes that his only option is to throw himself on the mercy of God. Let him work it out. So Job finishes with a warning for his three friends. Uh, ninth, uh, yeah, yeah. Finishes with a warning in verses 28 and 29. It's, he says, if you say, how shall we persecute him? And what pretext for a case against him can we find? Then be afraid of the sword for yourselves, for wrath brings the punishment of the sword, so that you may know there is a judgment. This is very poetic here. But in, again, today's vernacular, what Job is saying to his friends is the following. Be careful, because what goes around comes around. You've judged me. You've condemned me. Be very careful, because that sort of judgment will one day be facing you. All right, so we get to Zophar. I'll say it here, so far, so good. But anyways, we get to so far. I've been waiting five weeks to, to, to make that joke. <clears throat> yes, next slide. So this friend merely repeats so far. He merely repeats his argument and the argument, we know it by now, affliction is the result of sin. But for a moment, he doubts his own theory and argument. This is Zophar, he has a moment of doubt. So let's read chapter 20, verse two and three. Zophar says, therefore my disquieting thoughts make me respond, even because of my inward agitation. I listen to the reproof which insults me and the spirit of my understanding uh, makes me answer. And so Zophar's disquieting thoughts on account of Job's comments show that he is shaken in his position momentarily. Remember, Job has just said, be careful, what goes around comes around. So now, you know, Zophar takes a step back. He says, whoa, I'm, I'm thinking, my, uh, you know, in my mind, I'm a little agitated here. However, in the next verses, we see that he reverts to his initial argument. In other words, he doubles down on his argument, verse 27 to 29. It says, the heavens will reveal his iniquity and the earth will rise up against him. The increase of his house will depart. His possessions will flow away in the day of his anger. This is the wicked man's portion from God, even the heritage decreed to him by God. And so Zophar continues to argue that no matter how rich, no matter how favored uh, or how high a position one has, if he has sinned somehow, he will be brought low. And he demonstrates that while Job's arguments and claims may have affected him, he shows that he does not know any more than Job knows all of the circumstances surrounding his situation. And he also rejects Job's declaration that he is an innocent man who still trusts God to vindicate him. So, so far we said he was the hard-headed one, legalistic, you know, so he plays true to form in his speech. And so in chapters 21, Job, makes a reply to Zophar, and he actually comments on the subject of Zophar's speech, which has to do with the prosperity of wicked men. And so Job begins uh, with a question, an age old question concerning justice and the wicked. Chapter 21, verse seven to nine, he says, why do the wicked still live? Continue on, also become very powerful. Their descendants are established with them in their sight and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear and the rod of God is not on them. In essence, Job is saying, the wicked seem to live and prosper without any consequences. Like he says to Zophar and the other two, have you ever noticed, speaking of the law of retribution, have you ever noticed that a lot of wicked people, they're never punished, they get richer and richer. He then uh, questions the wisdom of the ages. In other words, he begins to question the law of retribution by pointing out some common examples that contradict 
this ancient wisdom. He also notes that hereditary guilt is not true or moral. You know, the, the, the sin of the father is on the son or the sin of the son is on the father. He says that idea is not, is not true. A point also made by the prophet Ezekiel, and it's interesting in Ezekiel 18 verse 20, that the prophet Ezekiel makes this point also as Job is making it in this here, and both of them are contemporaries. The Job was written around the same time that, that Ezekiel uh, prophesied. So we read in chapter 21, verse uh, 19, uh, it, Job says, you say God stores away a man's iniquity for his sons. Let God repay him so that he may know it. Let his own eyes see his decay and let him drink of the wrath of the Almighty. For what does he care for his household after him when the number of his months is cut off? Can anyone teach God knowledge in that he judges those on high or dies in full strength, being wholly at ease and satisfied? His sides are filled out with fat and the marrow of his bones is moist, while another dies with, bitter, with a bitter soul, never even tasting anything good, and together they lie down in the dust and worms uh, cover them. So Job's point is that from simple observation, we see quite plainly that many wicked men grow rich and they stay that way and then they die peacefully at a ripe old age and nothing bad happens to them or to their sons that they leave behind. And then he also says, we also see many righteous men live hard lives full of troubles and they die in the misery of their poverty. And he's saying to them, we know this, we've seen this, this is a common thing that we see. Can you explain that with the law of retribution? Much like Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes, Job states that these inconsistencies are common and death seems to be the great equalizer in all of this. And he refers to a judgment for the wicked that will come one day, even if for now he is buried the rich man, the wicked rich man, he is buried in a fine grave which is watched over and tended to. So we finish up the last portion of our scripture. He says, for the wicked is reserved for the day of calamity, they will be led forth at the day of fury. Who will confront him with his actions? And who will repay him for what he has done? While he is carried to the grave, men will keep watch over his tomb. The clods of the valley will gently cover him. Moreover, all men will follow after him while countless ones go before him. How then will you vainly comfort me for your answers remain full of falsehoods. So Job finishes up, he has not only, he has not only put his case for final judgment into God's hands at a future date, along with that of the wicked who will also likewise be punished, he has also repudiated the basis of his friend's arguments and assumptions against him as falsehoods. He just, at the beginning, he just said he didn't agree with them. Now that he posits this argument that, you know, judgment will come, but perhaps it'll only come in the future. Now that he's made that argument, he says to them, and what you guys are thinking is incorrect. I don't just disagree with it. I'm saying to you, it's false. In other words, Job is laying the groundwork for an argument or a new wisdom that says, sometimes the innocent suffer and the wicked go free, but one day God will judge both according to their actions and his wisdom, not man's wisdom. And here we see the shift in Job's thinking. So next week, chapters 22 to 37, we're going to see how this plays out in another cycle of speeches between Job and his friends. Okay, that's it for uh, this week. I think you've had enough. <laughs>